This is True North Story, the original podcast series. Learn, love, listen, live. Are you ready to discover your True North Story? With your hosts, Tama Fulton and John Hudson Maserol. Well, Josh, I'm, I'm so glad that we finally got a chance to get connected. This is only the second interview we've done uh, since we started, so I'm still kind of a newbie. When did you well, get started? So I got started fresh off the road around 2012, middle of 2012, and uh, I, I'd been touring until then, kind of settled back home, and that's when the company kind of unofficially launched, was 2012. Tell us a little bit about Josh's journey up to that point. You know, and I read that you're from San Diego originally, and was music always a big part of your life? I mean, you were in a band, you were the guitarist, and you were on the road, obviously you referenced touring. Talk to us a little bit about your life into music yeah i guess in a lot of ways that's the that's the beginning of all of it some sort of an artistic path i suppose i grew up uh, in california and we had some middle eastern music friends and that's kind of where that sort of artistic seed was sowed uh they they were these world musicians and we hung out with them a lot and i was just fascinated by that kind of artistic lifestyle and they had like a farm in the country in california and we hung out quite a bit there, my family and I. And it was just so magical and kind of interesting and right out of the gate, just way more interested in that than anything else. So that kind of got it, everything going, I suppose. How did you learn the guitar? And I was too little to kind of really play an instrument. Well, that's not true. There's plenty of kids you see on YouTube and stuff playing instruments. But at the time, I was doing more drawing, and that was kind of my outlet at, at the time. started with drawing, really. Even though music was kind of the goal, I suppose. Was it kind and, of a, uh, a bohemian lifestyle that you yeah. were, you yeah. loved? I could totally yeah. tell. Yeah. It's yeah. just kind of free thinking and lots yeah. of music and lots of nature. Yeah. And, you know, my, my folks really supportive of that. And uh, they're always really encouraging about kind of going after those passions and stuff and never really expected me to uh, follow the kind of normal, I suppose, at the time especially in the like 80s and 90s, like that sort of American ideal, you know, go to college, right. get a Free job. Suit, become a lawyer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we we'll make you. money doing that. I suppose it's a lot less common now. Back then, it was, that was definitely the thing you did. You know, everybody's going to college and getting a career. And my parents were real cool about all that. And they never really kind of pushed any of that sort of go get a career. You know, whether it be drawing initially or, or other forms of creative expression. Gosh, and, and this yeah, kind of I fostered mean, that. It was a lot of things at once. I mean, it, it start, started with music, and then it was comic books, and just, you know, we, we lived really close to Disneyland, and all of that kind of great, like, 50s, 60s kind of uh, wonderment, I suppose, as a, as a kid growing up in California, going there, and just kind of, I don't know, not wanting to live a normal life, I suppose, even when I was little, just kind of not being interested in it. I didn't know what it was at the time, I'm sure, but as I got older, it started becoming more apparent, I suppose. So yeah, uh, that was definitely the, the music, sort of Middle Eastern music and, and Bohemian lifestyle was really um, alluring right out of the gate, I guess. It just sort of branched off into different areas. After that, it was kind of just, which direction am I going to go with it? Yeah, it was all enticing. So when did you pick up the guitar? When did that become something that you wanted to do? You know, my mom, she was the one that actually told me that I should. <laughs> really? Uh, we were living, we had moved to Colorado by then, and my mom felt really strongly that I should start playing the guitar. And um, so I just kind of go, went with it. And uh, she bought me, my, my dad and her bought me a guitar. And uh, my dad told me that if I could learn how to play Stairway to Heaven, that they'd buy me an electric guitar. And how so, awesome is wow. that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those are some supportive parents, Josh. Oh, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> you know, most parents are like, uh, you know, creative, what? You want to be a musician, a painter, a writer? Get out of here. Go get, you know, yeah. get a trade. Yeah. Well, my dad was, uh, he was in the Vietnam War and he was a, he grew up with, you know, Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and, and all that. It was really important to him. And I think he was just excited to have a son that was even interested in it. I think that was like one of his big opportunities was like, oh man, you know, my kid's going to get into the same stuff I was into. And I think for a a lot of fathers not i don't know myself but i imagine for a lot of fathers that's kind of a big thing guitar like a common, was kind a of, common interest area that 
that you yeah can, like, something you could talk about yeah. something you can connect on so, so did you learn yeah. to play stairway to heaven and I did. did you get the electric guitar <laughs> the first, literally the first uh first song i ever learned how to play was stairway because i wanted an electric i wanted an electric guitar i could use distortion oh, that's awesome i didn't know how to play chords i just knew what was necessary to play that song Did you get together with friends and kind of jam and have a garage band, or how did that start? Yeah, I started writing my own songs right away. And I don't, I'm, I was a bit arrogant, I think, now that I look back, but um, I just really <laughs> was eager to be creative and, and make other things, I suppose, things that didn't exist. And uh, I wasn't very good, but by high school, so probably, what, eight or nine years after I don't know, maybe not that much, but seven or eight years after I uh, started playing, got a, some buddies together and we started like a ga punk band, which was, you know, that was the thing at the time. It was kind of a popular genre back then, <laughs> dating myself. But today, music today, I don't even know if there is a genre. I don't even know what, you know, uh, I mean, not, yeah. to, not to rag it out, but, <laughs> you know. No, it's kind true. Of like a, it's true. It was almost more definable. I mean, even then it was not very definable, but it's more definable than now. It's kind of exhausting now i I don't even know what i don't even bother anymore you know it's like it's so tightly controlled of what can and can't be played you know within the system of a certain genre of music that you're not you're getting the same thing over and over or you're getting new music that all sounds the same uh we talked to a musician james otto earlier on one of the podcasts and and he was talking about songwriters and how that's a dying art form in nashville and, yeah. you know, that's just, it's really sad. And it makes me think because I, I had read earlier about the best and worst thing about being a creative. And I, lo- mm. I love the answer that you, that you gave in there, which that you're not a big admirer of this world and, and of this generation. Yeah. And I just, uh, you know, I wanted you to kind of elaborate on that just a little bit. I don't think that that's anything new. I kind of feel like anybody kind of a broody artist type probably feels that way most of the time about the generation that they live in. Like they're out of, they're not in the right bot or they're, they're not surrounded by the, you were the born right too late. I guess. I, I mean, I don't think that it's anything new. I think that that's just how it goes. You long for something more simple or, or you're, you're waiting for everybody to, to kind of get on board or, or on the other hand, you're sick of everybody getting on board. I don't know. I, you just, whatever right. it is, you, you just wish there was something else. And I know for me in particular, I'm of that kind of ilk that wishes that things were lower and simpler and I don't know if that's cool or not but that's how I feel and I, I know a lot of I've got a lot of buddies who feel the same way I just wish that that things weren't so loud and so much noise and so much going on and it's and it's impossible to keep up with and and especially running a business it's it's hard not to and I do my best to only do what's necessary to function and pay bills but other than that I just I, I wish that I could just disconnect and I, I don't think that I'm the only one I think there's a lot of people that feel that way to, to go off of what you said yeah I just uh, I, I don't know I just wish I wish things were quieter I wish they were simpler I wish that there weren't so many people shouting all the time And How did you go from touring and being a musician and being on the road to kind of settling down and honing an amazing craft uh, <laughs> Thank you first of all uh, there's kind of this big gap of time, and I'll really just, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase, but uh, basically it was this, this huge journey of trying different creative outlets and being scared that I was, I don't know, I don't know what what happened along the way, but I was scared that it wasn't going to work. I, I guess I was doubting myself in a lot of ways for a long time. And uh, long story short, there came a moment where I was living in a smaller city in Colorado and the chance happened to move to Denver. And I, I kind of grown up in a lot of either the country in California or a small town in Colorado. And the chance happened where a friend told me that I was out of my mind and I needed to move to a bigger city. And I was afraid. And he, he just kind of called me out and told me I was a, kind of a coward and 
I kind of rose to that challenge, and I, I didn't want to be called a coward. So I think I moved less than a week later to Denver. I got, I think I got an apartment a couple of days after he told me that. He basically almost dared me to do something more. And I'd been serving and working at coffee shops and stuff, and just always afraid to take that big jump, do something I wanted. And uh, I moved to Denver, and not more than a week later, I was in a touring band, and I was being paid daily to play music. And it was... <laughs> It was amazing. It was just, I w- I'd gone from serving at P.F. Chang's to doing the thing I wanted my whole life. And it just took that, like, jump, that do something that didn't make sense. And, and so I did that for a long time, and then my, then my dad died four years later. I, I toured for four years, and my dad died, and uh, I'm the only man left kind of in the family to take care of everything. So I just sort of decided that touring was great, and it was, but families more important at least to me and so i stopped touring and came back home and kind of took up the mantle of what my dad left and um that's when starting a a business became a thing i want to ask you about your father because it sounds like you you had a close relationship with your dad and a little bit later in the in the podcast but I, i wanted to jump on that point you made about taking kind of that leap of faith Because that's a recurring theme that we continue to hear in our podcast series with artists. They up and left and moved to Nashville. Or they they did something that was kind of outside of their comfort zone to be able to get to the point, or the launching pad, let's say, for the next thing to happen, for amazing things to develop in their career. So when you take that leap, how do you keep from losing yourself when you find that thing you know what i mean like mm-hmm. like staying true to yourself because all of a sudden it's like whoa i'm doing this the training wheels have come off the bike and you're riding and it's like this could be really great and yeah. how do you kind of manage that without going off the rails oh I did. it's a complex <laughs> question i i think that it's probably different for everyone in in one way whatever it is that grounds people i suppose for me it would be family in a lot of ways i mean having parents that build you up, friends that build you up, or family, however that looks, that build you up without letting you get too arrogant, whatever that looks like. I know for me, it was my dad. My dad, it was a lot of my dad. He he saw an insecure boy. He, he knew that his son was insecure. And he, he raised me in such a way that I guess that he saw fit, which was basically some combination of overconfidence and Also, knowing what you have, I guess. I'm an only child, so I I think it was really apparent that they had to do a lot of work on me as far as (laughs) how to raise me to be brave, but also be thankful. And yeah, so all of those little nuances of of parenting, I'm just very fortunate that I had decent parents. And uh, for for me, that's what it was. It was my, my dad raising me to be strong and almost overconfident but at the same time knowing what i have and and not taking advantage of it i hope that makes sense i mean i think it was mostly just my parents trying to raise me to not be a asshole <laughs> <laughs> well i was saying, that's so funny you bring that up because i love the answer to one of your questions about what's going to happen this year or what's new this year whatever and you're like trying not to be a jackass and I, yeah. I just, I, I, or, or trying to be less of a jackass. And I just yeah. I love that because I wanted to ask you, what does that mean? What does jackass look like to Josh? And how do you, you know, know. try and not be one, be less of one? I don't right? know. I mean, be less of a yeah. jackass to everyone this year. I think that what a hard question to answer. <laughs> what what is a what is a person trying not to be a jackass? How do they answer that question without sounding like a jackass? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See, you got it. <laughs> There's the ego involved in the answer, saying not to be not to have an ego. Like, how, how well, do you do that? Well, okay, okay. So I'll do my best. I've got an enormous ego, and I know it. I, I think as an only child and as a a person, a creative person, and I think you guys are creative people. You're doing what you're doing, and you understand it. You do something that isn't just, you're not punching in numbers. You're not serving up coffee, which I don't mean that to say that people don't. Actually, on on the contrary, most of the people who are serving up coffee are probably creative people. <laughs> Starving artists. <laughs> That's why they're doing it. All that to say, you gotta be, you have to be arrogant. You have to, you have to be arrogant 
to create a little bit. If you're really going to do it, you have to be. And that's kind of, it kind of sucks to say that. Arrogant has such a negative connotation. But I, I don't particularly see it that way. Um, I think maybe arrogance isn't the word, but sort of a, a confidence. Confidence would be the nice way to say arrogant. Confidence in doing what you think is good and following through. So it's tricky to, to be able to juggle that kind of amount of confidence it takes to build something, play something, write something, and put it out, and then not feel superior to, to, to the people that aren't doing that. That's a tricky thing to do. Really important, though, because, because people see right through it all across the board. Everybody sees through it. They may not necessarily disapprove, but everybody sees it. Everybody knows when somebody's being a pompous jerk or, or when they think too much of themselves. It's, it's, I think people are really perceptive and it comes through on stage and it comes through on word and it comes through in your craft. And I know especially like we always talked about it on tour or an arrogant person or when everybody's not getting along, the crowd is really perceptive of what's happening on stage. And it's, that's why it was really important for us to all have really good relationships chips to all stay grounded because it, we knew that it, that people were smart. We knew that everybody in the crowd knew what was going on on stage. We could kind of pretend all we wanted, but it was really important to really actually be, we need to be passionate. We need to believe what we were doing. We need to be close. We need to, whatever arguments we had, we needed to resolve. It was all very vital in making that experience good. Because I think people are receptive. I know some people would argue, but they're more perceptive than people give them credit for. And so the, whatever, the consumer, the, the concert goer, the whatever, I, I think they actually really do feel what's happening. And I think it's really important to take that into account of what you're putting out. I think it, you need to do it with an integrity. Almost like an authenticity, right? And that would be true of your, of your business. Um, Sorry, I'm taking a couple swigs of rum. Oh, please do. So why a flask? All right. So to get kind of to get right to where we are now, my, my dad got me a flask when I was 18. I know for him, that was kind of a rite of passage, I guess. I think I think his dad got him a flask when he was around 18. I don't know. I always saw it as this sort of symbol of uh, manhood. I don't I'm not sure it is, but that's kind of how I saw it. And it always really kind of resounded with me as far as like a, a thing that you give somebody this flask is sort of like a, just like a token of love of friendship of camaraderie i know that that's how i saw it do you, you still know, have I, that flask from your dad oh yeah yeah absolutely it's on a shelf alongside his flask which i inherited when he passed away and wow yeah that's pretty yeah, cool he has a flask with his name on it and his birth year and I have one with my name on it, my birth year, and we don't we don't make one like that, but but that kind of sort of heirloom idea was was what spawned the flask concept. So, were you interested in working with metals, or what did you do when you said, "Hey, I think I'd like to make a flask"? So, in between playing music and doing other things, I was uh, a muralist and a glass hatch artist. So, I was doing front doors and, and transoms and custom artwork for homes and things like that. So, murals, pantry doors, those sorts of things. I, I was learning how to etch glass. So, I took those principles and I, I incorporated them into um, metal etching. And they're very similar. And uh, I, I think I made a birthday flask for our tour manager and uh it was like a octopus flask i'd got some cheap flask from like walmart or something like that and i'd etched it and kind of customized it and he he loved it that's how that kind of came about it, it was just a kind of a diy gift and and it sort of turned into something else slowly well in full disclosure tama and i each have one of your flasks do you yeah we do that we both feel oh. speaks to us on a deeper sense. She has yeah. the fall, and we're going to make our audiences go find out, we'll figure out which ones these are. Yeah. And uh, and I have the misbehaving one, which oh, cool. just yeah. the minute I saw that, I'm I like, that because as, a, as classic film fans, you yeah. can hear the jazz music. Just yeah. when I look at it, you can hear the music. You know what I mean? It's like, that's, yeah. that's, that's, like it's right you know, there. To kind of bounce off of that, I was inspired for that specific Flask from the movie uh, Memphis Bell. Right. Yeah, just, sure. 
I don't know if you guys ever seen that movie. I loved that movie when I was a kid, and and that's kind of when I when I started making fuss. That's what movie inspired that. Was that from the nose art of the World yeah, War Yeah, nose art aircraft? specifically nose yeah. art. I, I started studying World War Two sort of history, and I have a lot of World War II books, and uh, that's right. what inspired that specific class, was the sort of irreverence of what was ahead, that we're probably yeah. going to die, but we might as well have a great time, and there's something about that that really it's, resounded it's almost, with yeah, me. It's almost like knowing who you are in the face of something that is potentially life ending it's yeah. like we're going to go in and what happens happens kind of thing yeah i mean tam and i are both huge classic film yeah. lovers of all genres and all eras of classic film yeah. but particularly we love film noir which is is mostly yeah. in the 40s and early 50s and love it but i love silence and pre-code and we love all of it true north stories meant to inspire encourage motivate and offer hope and now back to the program I love what you do with with the way you take the flasks and you make them pure, worn and lived and mm. authentic, but not fake. Not that you're trying so hard to create that feeling that it mm. goes over too far or over the top. Yeah. It, it, it's like something that you could have gotten from a third or fourth generation given to you, yeah. passed down as an heirloom, and it just feels right. I have a, you have a real talent. Thank you. Thank you. I have a uh, a double barrel shotgun my grandfather owned and then my dad owned it and now I own it and uh something about that kind of heritage is really important to me and and I suppose that's kind of something in that spirit is where we get our aesthetic all the all the flats are they have that like rat rod kind of uh sitting in a basement vibe it's definitely not easy to to achieve it without making it look cheap we, we we work really hard on it, and yeah, it's it's meant to kind of have a, a certain style. It's intentional that hot rod kind of feel. But yeah, in that spirit, there's there's something very intentional. We we really love that era, specifically like 30s and 40s. It's really really dear to us, and um and we just wanted to kind of pay homage to that uh, that feeling that whatever it is, the romance of that era. That's just really where. All of our stuff comes from is is that I don't know they, that the the romance of an era where they like really like they didn't know what was going to happen they didn't know if this was it and I feel like a lot of my peers and a lot of this generation we're we're starting to get to that point where we're we're starting to wonder what what's going to happen and and I feel like there's kind of a, a parallel right now where we don't really have anything. That we're we don't have a World War Two but we're getting to that point where we're starting to wonder like is this how can we go further? What's happening to us? And and uh, I think there's a, there's actually a lot of um, sympathetic feelings to those bygone eras, and and I, th- I think that's why there's so many young men and women that I guess they want to sympathize with it. They want to they want to know what that must feel like. To, they want to care about where they are. And um, I, I guess that's that's where we got our aesthetic is is just really wanting to be passionate about our lives and our families and our friends and. I guess being noble, being honorable, kind of like almost like your individuality of, of who you yeah. are and what you stand for, and speak to the importance of of listening to all voices, but yet knowing what your own is. When you were talking about your company and your flasks and your designs, you kept using the word "we," and I know that you and your wife uh, work together on these projects mm-hmm. and these beautiful things. How did you guys meet? My wife and I, we met through a mutual friend of ours. And uh, at the time, I was a pretty heavy drunk. And so I kind of am embarrassed when I when I first met her because the first couple of times I met her, I think I was probably crying and drinking a lot of whiskey and <laughs> smoking a ton. <laughs> it's, it's embarrassing, but it's true. It's the life of a, it's the life of a touring musician. 
I well, yeah, yeah. The the band I was in, we were they still are uh, primarily Christian group, but uh, drinking wasn't discouraged. It was encouraged on some level. It was great experience and uh, they're beautiful people. But yeah, I, I we we were drinking a lot of whiskey on the road and and it was it was a wonderful time. But but getting off the road, dad dying and and all of that, all of the things that I kind of did casually became very very saturated so i was drinking I, I was drinking casually before but then i was drinking professionally almost and uh so we had when we met i was a mess but i got my uh i got myself together a bit and uh we uh we kind of hung out and uh yeah yeah it was quick i knew almost immediately that i wanted to marry her and it was one of those weird moments where i never believed people when they said that um that you just know I always thought that was just a thing that people said, but when I met her it was it was that. Which is kinda humbling, I guess. You probably work really well together. She must be really artistic and creative like you are. She is, but more than anything she's less erratic. Keeps you grounded a little bit? Absolutely. I've kinda without a rudder most of the time. And um she's just she's just solid. She's solid as a rock, and I don't think that as a company we would be where we are if she wasn't. I, I knew I always wanted to marry a woman that, that would um, be able to come alongside me and kind of be a great partner, not just as a wife, but as a friend, as a confidant, as somebody who could speak into my life, that I could speak into their life. It was always really important to me, and and she was all those things, and it was very apparent, and um, it, it works really well. And in business, uh, we work well together. We we make flasks every day, and when we're not making flasks, we're renovating houses and doing all that, and we work really well together, and it's because she's so grounded and so solid. I kind of go off the tracks day in, day out, but, but she's very, very, very solid. And do you guys do designs together, too? Yeah, yeah, we do. She gets ideas, I get ideas, and I trust her implicitly, and um, I'll kind of get these whims, and I'll make a design, and she's definitely the last sort of checkpoint before something goes out. And she'll remind me if I'm being lazy, or she'll remind me if I'm cutting corners, and it's really helpful. That's really wow. cool. What a great partnership you guys have. Mm-hmm. Agreed. I promised I would ask about your dad. And that's the last heavy question, and then we can go into <laughs> just some quick, fun, interesting stuff. Yeah, just, sure. Uh, you mentioned, you know, um, when somebody asked you about a mantra or a motto that you live by, you said, every day becoming like the man my dad was. Yeah. And that just really hit me because my dad was 50 when I was born, uh -huh. and I didn't really understand my dad and where he was coming from until I was much older. And yeah. he was gone. At that yeah. time, but yeah. you know, and so I just, can you share just a little bit about what about your dad you aspire to and why? Uh, it's um, sorry, it's no, I, I just got emotional <laughs> myself. So, yeah, so, so. it all is a little. You know, I uh, he wasn't a perfect man, but he was my father, and he was a good father, and he was loving, and he was kind, and to me, he wasn't really particularly kind to anybody else but he was good to me and my mom and one or two others so i've i've long felt that my father did everything he could to put the best parts of him into his son and he, he wasn't a perfect man but he but he did his best to put the best qualities that he could into his son and he raised me that way to kind of go off of what you just said i it took me a while to recognize that i I got older and I realized what he was doing. I realized that he wanted to improve on the kind of person he was. He wanted to improve the kind of man he was. And he had a son and he had that opportunity. And I'm not sure I lived up to that. And I'm not sure that I will ever live up to that. But I know that I want to. And I know that he inspired me to want to. So I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good man. I want to live with passion. I want to live with integrity. I want to fight for what I think is important. It's, it's, it's all these sort of dramatic principles, but they should be dramatic. I think that they should be the sort of things that we should all want. I think we do. And that's the kind of son he wanted to raise. He wanted to raise a better version of what he was. And I'm not a father, but I, I hope to continue what 
he wanted for me when I have a son or a daughter or become a father and became a parent once he wasn't around anymore. I wish I could talk to him about it, but I can't. And I, I just now I just want to make him proud and, and, and say the things that I wish that I could have when he was alive. And I think I did my best, but I think that's what he wanted. He wanted me to be a good man. And I'm not a great man, but I, I'm working on it. So, uh, yeah. Well, I think that he just heard you. And I think yeah. that a whole lot of people appreciate those words, Josh. That's it's very, very powerful. Very powerful. I want to yeah. ask you just quickly, uh, Sneerwell, where'd that come from? <laughs> so on tour, you get real bored, which is, you'd be surprised, but there's miles and miles and miles of nothing. And you just sit on a bus and you run out of things to joke about and you run out of things to watch and video games to play and you just kind of start doing some real weird stuff and uh we dance with boxes on our heads and just just all the dumb antics and uh i would do this weird character where i would curl my mustache and i'd start doing this sort of um i guess like uh like a real weird dastardly kind of character and I, <laughs> I i'd kind of get up on the on the benches and and on the tables and i'd put on my hats and kind of slink around and everybody ended up calling that character the sneer well. Oh. And it was just this sort of like, uh, you know, the, the, the character, the archetype that like people to train tracks and stuff. Right. Yeah. Like Dudley do right. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, I don't know what his name is. Dick Dastardly, I think. Yeah. From the cartoon. That's his name. Yeah. That sort of slinky character. And, and, uh, his name was Balthazar the sneer well. According to character, just what the things we make up is there's a there's a hundred stories, but that was that was that character, and it came to name the company. I felt right, I guess it felt like a good sound. It sounded right. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's silly, but I just didn't want to. I just didn't want to name the company something cool, and I don't think that our name is cool. I think it's silly. I I, I think it's meant to be. I don't. I I, I get tired of cool things everything's so cool all the time and it's just boring and i just wanted something that sounded kind of i don't know silly well it's definitely memorable i'll tell you that so and yeah and you're a connoisseur obviously of uh different liquors and is bourbon your uh, go-to or whiskey or rum what what do you what do you like to put in your flask oh uh so my my palate isn't very good i don't think uh, my dad was always giving uh, wild turkey. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I think that's kind of like uh, I'm trying to think of a like a good comparison, but it's kind of like just like just going full throttle, like no subtleties, no nuances. It's just just really, really, really angry whiskey, and uh, that's what I drank for years. Uh huh. One, one turkey with no water. So Ouch. when it, when everybody started like. <laughs> Oh, try this whiskey. Try this. Ooh, do this. It's got notes of blah, blah, blah. It was kind of like, <laughs> I, I guess, I don't know. It would be like drinking moonshine and then, oh, no, but try this actual whiskey. Oh, no, I'm used to drinking things out of toilets. Not to say that wild turkey's that, but but just that same kind of like, it's like burn, a moonshine burn your throat. kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, like, this is not the point. The point is that life's really hard and I want to drink something and hang out for a while. That's not. I, I really love a good whiskey now. I've gotten palate's gotten better, but for a long time I was like, man, this doesn't taste like anything. Here, try this wild turkey. Oh, and, that's uh, funny. So what? So yeah. what is your go-to bourbon now? I'm assuming it's not wild turkey anymore. You know, or maybe it is. <laughs> half the time, <laughs> half the time it is. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> now, Josh. I just got, now I just kind of feel like it's rock and roll. But uh, no, we drink a lot of um, local guys here. They're doing uh, Tin Cup and uh, Laws. We're really big right. fans of those guys. And they're really cool. Oh, that's good to uh, know. Yeah. Yeah. We've cool got guys. some Tin Cup. We've been talking about some Breckenridge, too. I'm not sure. I've heard good yeah. things about Breckenridge. I mean, we're real lucky. I mean, Denver's just boozing it up. <laughs> <laughs> they, just, they just know what they're doing. I feel like if you want a substance and you want to have it, Denver's a good place to, to get it. I mean, whether it's beer, booze, or what have you. But Breckenridge is a great uh, Tin Cup. Laws. Stranahan's still great. They got, I think they got bought by uh, Patron, but it's the same product, and they're just 
particular product. Tell us a little bit about uh, the ink, Josh. I'm trying to get Tama to uh, to commit. I've got one in a story around my ink on my left inner wrist, but I know hmm. you've got a lot of artwork done on your body. So what what's your favorite and why? My favorite tattoo is uh, they're my fingers. So I've got my parents' initials on my right hand, and I've got my dad's birthday on my left, my four knuckles on my left hand. And everybody thinks that it says 1946. Everybody's like, you're not born you're not in that 1946. Old. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, right. I know. It's not your birthday. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, those are my two favorite. I've got tattoos. I've got good ones and bad ones all over the place. I mean, from touring, you know, you kind of got to you get a couple days off and get a, get some work done. It's become so prevalent. It's almost, it, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It's just like getting your hair done or your... Do you have plans for a new ink? I don't. I'm too busy Making flasks. <laughs> making flasks and renovating houses that I can't afford it anymore. It's so cool and I still love it, but... Now I that it's the these, thing and yeah, everybody's doing yeah, it, you're like, ah, yeah. I'm not going to be there anymore. That's not me anymore. Yeah. I hear yeah. you. I hear you, Josh. I suppose you said, you know, you know, when you when I was a kid and I I was making, I, I my first job was I was the Red Robin Bird, which I don't think is a thing anymore. But when, back back when I was a kid, they had to dress up like a Red Robin and you'd walk around the restaurant and shake kids' hands and stuff like that. I was making nine dollars an hour and uh, I just didn't have anything to do with the money, so I would like just buy musical instruments and CDs and you know you get you get older and you, you have all these things to pay for and I can't can't justify it anymore. I've got all these great little things on me that kind of reflect the time in my life where it was a little bit simpler, I suppose. Well, people wow. want to find a sneer. Well, flask. Where do they go? Well, in Seattle, which is where you guys are, right? Yep. Uh, Luca Great Finds place in Ballard. Very cool neighborhood. They're, Very yeah, artsy. We, God, we love it over there. They carry us. And then if you're not in Seattle, then uh, the sneerwell.com always, you can get stuff there. But, but we really like it when people can make it into a shop. We get less of a cut, but it's really important. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. So it's really important for us. When you see them, yeah. you know, and the, and the packaging and every, it's just like, it takes it up even higher than it already is. So I, I totally get that, wanting to yeah. wanting people to experience that in person. Yeah, it's different. You get to pick it. I mean, do mm-hmm. our best to send the best flask out on mine sales. But, you know, if you, if you go to, if you get a chance and you can go to a store and you can pick out, they all look different. Is mm-hmm. there one design? You have tons of awesome designs and they do all speak to different people for different reasons. Is yeah, there thanks. one that seems to sell the best over the other? Um, you know, I wish that I could say there was, but there's a few designs that sell quite a bit, but I did, it, it also always remarkable to um, everybody likes something different. And that's kind of, I guess that's kind of the point. We don't yeah. really have a best seller. It's everybody kind of latches on to a certain aesthetic, a certain time period, a certain art, style you know we bounce between colonial and uh you know world war ii and then like more like ethereal and kind of whimsical designs yeah i i don't think there is one i I think it's just i i I really don't i think the hellhound is probably the closest thing to a bestseller we have that's the the one with a wolf with a bunch of arrows in it that 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 is not surprising because tam and i both so crazy our favorite animal is the wolf yeah, seriously. So yeah, you just beautiful yeah. and strong and interesting. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, yes. <laughs> the, 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 I think the wolf mirrors humanity yeah, I, without getting too ways. deep. You know what I mean? Like the eyes and and their and the way they look, and it's almost like they're in thinking through the process. Yeah. Wild, wild, gentle and at yet, the same time, and yet gentle and social. Weird. I think so too. I mean. Living in the mountains for a while and living in the country, I mean, you just kind of, there's something about that that's very, um, very easy to relate to, just this sort of animalistic kind of quality. I think a lot of people would probably compare themselves to a, to that animal. And <laughs> I mean, we all want to be that, and some of us <laughs> are, and some of us aren't, and some of us fall short. And, but it's hilarious you bring that up because I'm wearing my part wolf t shirt today. So, you know, Buy Me Brunch is a t-shirt company out of L.A., and they just do crazy, weird stuff on their t-shirts. Yeah. 
And they just have one that just, I saw it one day, and this was a couple of years ago, it just says part wolf. I'm like, oh, uh, you know, I got to have this. Oh. And uh, <laughs> um, so I'm like, I have that T-shirt on today. So I'm like, it, it's yeah. just. Yeah, you know, that's that's the that, that one in the uh, the Eye of Providence. I think that's the other one. Kind of yeah. uh, almost, it's, it's weird because it's a Christian symbol and it's also an occult symbol. So it's kind of nebulous in that way. It, it's ambiguous enough that, that a lot of people kind of, it's this weird sort of thing where it started as a Christian symbol, and then it ended up as a kind of a, a cult symbol somehow. We're not trying to kind of appeal to any one kind of group, but we just appreciate the artwork, and, and I think it's a cool symbol. So The other one is uh, that we've been doing really well with the Oddfellows, uh, which wow. is real cool. I mean, the Oddfellows, kind of just the history of the Oddfellows is really cool, um, regardless of your kind of political or spiritual beliefs. It's a really cool kind of history element, specifically American, the Odd Fellows kind of things that they started is yeah. very cool. Well, my wife and I actually got married in an Odd Fellows Hall. Yeah, here in Denver. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, but uh, but we, yeah, we when we found that Odd Fellows Hall, it was this twenties ballroom kind of real cool, real cool stuff. Cam and I really appreciate what you're doing, and we just think it's really great. This is part of the True North story is that you have a really interesting story to tell, and you're doing amazing things. And there's four things that we always talk about with True North story. We talk about inspiration, encouragement, motivation, and hope. And that's what we want our mm-hmm. guests to bring to people is that, hey, you know what? Through Josh's story, go out and figure out what's working for you. Go work your art, you know, learn something that you're, you, you'll you become really passionate about and contribute yeah. in a larger sense. We just think it's great. We'll put your link to the Sneerwell on along with the podcast, put some pictures of some of your products in the blog post so they'll be able yeah. to see you and bit of you and your wife together. It's really important that um, it's us as a unit. So we're blessed to have you on the podcast. I guess. We absolutely uh, yeah, are. Yeah. I mean, I mean, not not to say that like, yeah, you you should feel really <laughs> fortunate, but we we just we, we just do. don't know what to say. We don't know what to say. You've said so much, Josh. You are a, you, you are a, a deep person who thinks deeply and thoughtfully. You have so much wisdom in you to share, and so much beauty. And you express yourself in so many ways. And we we fell in love with your product, with your story, with you and your wife and the work that you do together. And we just, we really wanted other people to see and hear for themselves. Well, we want to keep a low profile, but we also want them to, to make something. It's such a tricky balance. I mean, if we, if we had our way, we would just... We would live in the mountains and we'd just hang out with each other and our family and, and, and never have to talk about anything ever and never <laughs> give our opinions because it's, it's so, it's, it's, it seems so boisterous and so pompous and it's so difficult to speak about the things that you feel strongly about yeah. without sounding like you're oh, preaching you get or, they, yeah, oh, it's just, just so difficult. And we don't you. we don't ever want to. As often as we can avoid it, we do. But but we do feel strongly about what we do, and it's balancing act. It's always stuck with me, and I'm always like that. Said that that quote just always stuck with me. It's like it's not that I do, I don't like people. It's just that I prefer when they're not around, and mm. uh, that's okay too. You know, it's like we don't have to all be social creatures. I mean, gotta right. gotta do it. Josh, awesome. thanks so much it. for being on True North Story. Yeah, lovely. Thank you for listening to True North Story, the series. Follow us on Twitter at True North Story and tune in next time for another True North Story.